Uh, Lord, we just pray that as we read uh, this scripture and as we go into it and try to understand what it is that your word is trying to say to us about who you are, uh, God, may you increase the worship in our hearts. May you increase our faith in you. May you increase your beauty before us. May you help us to see who you are and thus worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So next Sunday is Easter, <coughs> as all of you know. And you know, while we talk about Jesus every week here, uh, it's uh, a common topic, of course. But Easter is, is unique. Easter is unique because it's a season when we really try to see Jesus with new eyes. Uh, when we really try to understand more deeply what his mission was and what he accomplished. So, you know, Easter season is a very uh, special time. Uh, I don't want you to just kind of go by it without really taking advantage of uh, this season. So let's really try to understand Jesus in a new way. Uh, let's try to open up our hearts to what God may want to give us for this Easter season. Now I'm sure most of us here have wondered at some point, uh, how does God think? Or what motivates God? Or uh, what does God want from me? Right? We, we have these questions about God and for God. And the answer really is, Jesus. Jesus, he is the clearest picture we have of God. Uh, if you want to understand how does God's heart work, what motivates him, what drives him, what does he want from me, uh, you have to look at Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the intimacy of God in the body. Right? It is the closeness of God. It is God who has come near as close as he possibly can to us. Someone we can see, someone we can touch. And that is who Jesus is. So, Jesus is the answer to all of those questions. And what is it that we celebrate on Easter? We celebrate what? Resurrection. Right? We celebrate that Jesus rose again from the dead. How can you celebrate how Jesus rose uh, if you don't fully understand how he lived and how he died? And so we really need to understand what is it that he accomplished? What is it that he lived for? How did he die? What did his death do? Uh, we really need to kind of meditate on that to really fully celebrate Easter. Now it's so easy to uh, know Jesus without really knowing him. Because it's, it's just a part of our everyday Christian uh, walk. Right? We, we, we talk about Jesus, we sing about Jesus. So it's so easy to just say, I know Jesus without really knowing him. Especially for those of you who've known Jesus for a long time, especially for those of you who've been Christian for a long time, we assume that we know everything about Him, and yet know so little about Him, including myself. You know, I, sometimes uh, that is my biggest obstacle to really getting to know Him is assuming I already know. So today we're going to go back to Jesus uh, to really kind of unpack who He is to try to get closer to what he means for us. Now, who is this man, Jesus? Uh, we're going to start from the beginning. Verse 1. Verse 1 tells us, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, if there's one thing that's true, uh, it's that sometimes we need to question our beliefs in order to see things more clearly. And I, I just mentioned that, right? that we, we think we know Jesus and therefore we, we never get the chance to really know him. And sometimes we need to question that. Sometimes, uh, you know, for me as a pastor, sometimes I need to stop and really think about you, the people in the ministry, to really think about who you are to me. And that helped me to realize how blessed I am. I need to just stop and think about each person. Yes, this person is so valuable, is so precious, is such a blessing to my life. And if I don't stop and think about that, sometimes 
I'm not that thankful. Sometimes I just take people for granted. Or on special days like my wedding anniversary or on you know, my wife's birthday, uh, I have to write a card right, uh, to commemorate that day. And every time I write that card, I remind it again. It's a miracle that I found someone like her. Right? I'm so blessed to be with someone like her. But day to day, it's easy to forget that. It's easy to just think, okay, she's always going to be in my life. She's just there. But on those special days, I'm reminded, right, she, this is really special. What I have is so special. It's so amazing. And sometimes uh, it's a tragedy. Sometimes uh, you go to a funeral, maybe, maybe even a funeral of someone you know very well. And then you remember, right, life is a gift. Life is a gift and it can be gone the next day. It can be gone suddenly, right? Without any warning, it can end. Life is a gift I need to cherish every day. I need to cherish the people around me right now. Now, would we say that all of these things are more accurate ways of looking at things? Right? Wouldn't we say that? Wouldn't we say that? The, the, the way that I see my wife when I'm riding my car, or the way that I think about you when I stop and really meditate on you, or the way that I feel after a funeral about my life, wouldn't you say that that is actually more accurate? That is the right way to think about those things. So what we're seeing is somehow we're all drifting away from how we should be seeing things, right? That's the natural, we need to see that, that naturally we are all drifting away from the accurate view of the people in our life, uh, our, our lives themselves, about God, right? It's just, there is this gradual shift that we need to be aware of, okay? So, today we're going to try to fight that back, okay? Today, we're going to try to go back to what is the accurate way of looking at Jesus. And we're going to do that by just kind of unpacking this word. And, you know, for me, sometimes when I think about the fact that Jesus exists at all, it's stunning. And I know that sometimes you can accept Jesus so easily and yet have a hard time uh, with other parts of the Christian faith. Uh, I know that that was true for me at one point, but when you really think about who Jesus is, He really is the most alien, the most strange, the most unexplainable event in all of human history, right? Think about this. Even if aliens from another planet came to our Earth uh, and visited us, or even if angels showed up here, or demons showed up here, or even Satan himself showed up here, that would be strange, and that would be, that would be amazing, that would be astounding, we'd be shocked, right? But actually, there is still something we have in common with all those things. Even if aliens came from another planet, even if Satan himself showed up right in front of us, all of those things are created beings. They're all finite, they're all limited. Satan is finite and limited. Aliens are finite and limited. There's nothing we know in this universe that exists as a limitless and infinite being, except God. There's only one example of that. God is the strangest, most foreign thing in this entire universe. In all of our reality, there is nothing we can compare God to. There is no comparison you can make. It, it doesn't exist. You can't say God is like this. You can't say that. So no matter how smart you are, you can't take the concept of infinity and say, I understand eternity. None of us can. Because there is no example of eternity in our reality. It's just a concept. But you can't understand what infinity actually is. Because our reality is finite. Think about that for a moment. And yet, Jesus, we say that Jesus was fully God, as if he was absolutely this incredibly alien and foreign being to the fullest, and yet he was also fully human as a limited being in time, in space, 
walking on earth. 100% that foreign being that we have no comparison to, that we can't even comprehend, that we can't even grab, not even the smartest of us, and yet he was also someone we could touch, someone we could speak to, someone we could see, someone who was confined to a human body. Think about that. That is impossible. That, that is the greatest mythology. Isaiah said that the idea of Jesus is hard to believe. I want that to be really true for us. Not to just say, yeah, Jesus, yeah, he's, he's part of my faith. Okay, I just accept it. But really think about how unbelievable it is that he exists at all. And that we believe he's real. He's in our history. We can point to the places he walked on this planet. Now I want you to take the weight of that unimaginably incredible, impossible Jesus. Take that idea of, wow, that is, that is impossible. How can that even exist? How can that be real? And I want to let I want you to let that idea seep into all the other parts of your life. Your concerns right now. What are you concerned about? What are your struggles right now? What are your worries about the future? I'm sure many of you are worried. What, what am I going to do next year? What am I going to do 10 years from now? Your job, your family, your friends, marriage, your goals, whatever that may be. Let that impossibility of who Jesus is, that he shouldn't even exist, that it defies what we understand as possible, and let that seep into all of those things that are on your mind and your mind. And I want you to think how possible or difficult do all of those things look when you really put them next to this impossible how difficult do those things look when you really put those two things together side by side? Don't start with how impossible your problems are. You need to start with how impossible Jesus is. Jesus is impossible. Start with that, the truth of that, that this is real, and then bring that into your impossible situation, and then realize they're actually not that impossible. If this is real, then that has incredible implications for my concerns and my struggles. They are not as big as I found they were. And if you really let the weight of who Jesus is into your heart, just really let it, the impossibility of it, really sink into your heart, uh, you will be moved beyond just simple answers and solutions to uh, the questions in your life. Because you'll realize that even if this incredibly impossible, this thing that this, this person that shouldn't exist, even if he answered your questions, we would have no idea how to receive that answer. We wouldn't have the capacity to understand his answer to our questions. Because he is so foreign. He exists in a totally different realm of reality than us. Now verses 2 to 3 tell us more about the character of God. And it says, For he, for Jesus, grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteem him not. Uh, I remember there was a time in my, in my walk with God when I thought God was so vain and petty. I thought he was such a child because he's always asking people to worship him. Like, why are you so insecure, God? Why do you constantly need people to worship you? Can't you just like let it go? Like, just, just be okay with who you are. Why are you always asking us to worship you and say how great you are. And I just felt like, God, you know, you're, this, is, this is not very, uh, this is unbecoming of you. You know, <laughs> just let it go. Let your people relax. You're great. Okay, we all know that. And I just felt like he was so 
petty that he would do this. And I would interpret things in my life based on that view of God. So when things didn't go well in my life, I thought, okay, it's because I didn't give him enough praise. He's, he's angry with me, right? So he's being petty. All right, God, I understand you need 24 hour worship, and I didn't, I didn't respect him enough. So now, you know, these bad things are happening in my life because of that. I don't know if that's something that you ever struggled with, but there was a season in my life where, where I felt that. But two things changed my view of God uh, and changed my life because of that view changed. I realized worshiping God, uh, yes, it is what God commands us, but what I realized is that worshiping God makes me whole. And it is actually the most loving thing that God can do to tell us to worship Him. When we worship Him, we find peace. When we worship Him, we understand who we are. When we worship Him, we feel love. We feel truly human. And it is the most loving thing He can do to constantly tell us that we need to worship Him. That is how we were created. So that is the first thing I understood. And the second thing is, as I looked at Jesus, I realized I can't accuse God of being arrogant or petty. The more I looked at Jesus, I realized it doesn't make sense. He had no majesty. He had no beauty. He had no status. In other words, everything that we, in our world, we use to value someone, to judge someone, as to how valuable that person is, Jesus didn't have any of that. He didn't have educational achievement. He didn't have career achievement. He didn't have physical appearance. He had nothing to attract people naturally. If you really think about that, that's astounding that God would choose to come in this way. What does that say about who He is? What does that say about His priorities? About what He believes is important to us? Now, there's another implication. This teaches us about how God works in the world. And if you don't recognize that this is how God's power works most of the time, you will believe that God is not working in your life. What I mean is, this non-majestic, not very beautiful, no status, nothing to attract us naturally. Very ordinary, right? Very ordinary. Just, you know, someone you might just pass by on the street without even noticing. But if this is how you believe, if you don't believe that this is how God works most of the time in this world, then you will miss many of His ordinary miracles. And when I say ordinary miracles, I mean there is no such thing as a miracle that's ordinary. But what I mean is, you know what I mean? Those miracles that they're not the supernatural kind that excite us, but you will miss the miracles that He's doing in hearts. You will miss the miracles He's doing in people's perspectives because you will have a different definition of what God does in your life. And I would argue that the ordinary miracles are the more powerful the ones that develop your humility, the ones that teach you how to pray more regularly, uh, the miracles that teach you how to forgive someone that you found hard to forgive, those are the more powerful miracles because those are what really change your life. Now, does God work in extraordinary ways? Yes, of course. And let me say this very clearly. We should pursue everything that is of God. I'm not saying we should not pursue those things. I'm saying pursue everything of God, but don't miss the ordinary miracles. Don't miss what He's doing in your life that is not as beautiful, not as majestic, not as special seeming. And when you look at the life of Jesus, you see this. Even though he was the Son of God, every day he was spending time in prayer by himself with the Father. He was studying the Word of God. He was memorizing Scripture. 
He was fasting. He was doing all of these spiritual disciplines. What you want to see is he did not despise the daily, regular practices of maintain, maintaining intimacy with his father. He made sure that he was always doing those things. And here's another thing we need to keep in mind. Jesus actually rebuked those who were always looking for signs and miracles. And he said, why are you always looking for these things? Not because those things are wrong. Again, I want to make it very clear. Jesus, he wanted to do miracles. He wanted to bless people. But he rebuked people when all they were looking for were signs and miracles. And he said, don't, don't go after these things like this because there's so much more for you. This is not the end goal. There's so much more for you. There are greater miracles than these. What the scripture tells us is that the ordinariness of Jesus is very easy to despise. The ordinariness of how God works sometimes is very easy to dismiss and say, this is not the work of God, or this is not what I was waiting for. And isn't it true? Many times we wonder while we're doing these daily disciplines, reading the Bible, you know, going to church, praying, and you know, fellowshipping, and you know, all these regular disciplines that we try to do, isn't it true that so often we don't see the majesty, we don't see the beauty and the status and the, the, you know, the supernatural element to these things, and we wonder, is God really in, in these things? But He is. When we look at Jesus, we understand that is how he works many times. Let me say this. A gospel message that focuses mostly on your personal needs. A salvation that focuses on the promises of a better job or you know, a nicer home or a healthier body or a life of less suffering. suffering. If that is the epitome of the gospel, the highlight of what salvation means for you, if that is the gospel message that you focus on, then that is a gospel that is more attractive to what Jesus did before the cross than what he did on the cross. That is not true gospel. If your gospel of salvation is mostly how you can be saved in your physical needs, and that is dismissing what Jesus did on the cross. That is the salvation that He wanted to give us. More than anything else. Don't, make, don't water down the gospel so that it's mostly about your physical needs. Understand that Jesus wants so much more. Now we're going to go to verses 4 to 5. In verses 4 to 5 it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Now, there is a very hard truth that is in this passage. Jesus experienced unimaginable violence. We all know this, right? If, if you are a Christian, uh, for any amount of time, you understand just how much suffering that cross brought to Jesus. It was probably the most painful and fortuitous way to die. He experienced physical, emotional, and spiritual pain, violence to him, himself, that we probably will never understand. But, and this is where the hard truth comes in. But Jesus was also perfectly obedient. And he did no evil. Now I know you all know that, but let me kind of move on to say what that means for us. Uh, now like many, of, like many of you, I've asked the question, God, I thought you loved me. Why would you let me suffer? You've asked that question. I've asked that question. If God loved me, He wouldn't let me experience these kinds of things in my life. Right? That is the logic that we, we come with, right? The Father allowed His Son to be crushed. Now, I know that we look at the cross and we understand.
understand because we have the New Testament. We have all of these theological uh, writings that help us to understand the suffering of Jesus. But there are many moments in our life where we don't have a theological explanation for our suffering. Right? There are many moments where we suffer greatly and we have no answers for why it happened. And then we say, right, uh, very reasonably, Jesus, if you love me, if you really cared about me, you would not let this happen to me. But what we see in this passage is that even in extreme suffering, there is no reason to believe that God does not love us deeply and that He is with us because that was true for His Son, Jesus. If it is true for Jesus that even in that extreme suffering, His Father loved Him deeply, wanted the best for Him and was with Him, then how much more so for you? It is true for you. It is true for me. The existence of suffering in our lives does not contradict the love of God or the presence of God. That is not an argument that we can bring before God when we can see Jesus before us. But I want to bring this a little bit closer to our everyday experience. Uh, you know, we're talking about Jesus here, uh, and you know, He was the Son of God. And we're, we're, just, we're just regular people. So I want to tell you a story that, that I read recently. A few years ago, there was a young couple in America. And this young couple, uh, both the husband and the wife, they were 29 years old. So they were fairly young, not, not an old couple. And they were preparing to go on missions to Japan, full-time missionaries. Uh, and they had three young children as well. If we can show the slide for the family. So that's the family. Um, a beautiful family. They, they loved God. They were excited. They were prepared to, to leave everything to, to spread the gospel. They were so passionate. They were learning Japanese, learning culture. On their way to a gathering, uh, a truck hit them from behind, hit their car from behind. And all five members of the family passed away. Now, as a pastor, uh, that is, I mean, how, what, do you, what do you say? I don't envy any pastor who has to walk into a situation like that and try to make sense of that. I can't imagine what the church experienced through that tragedy. And while I said that Jesus shows us that God's love and suffering can coexist without contradiction, contradicting each other, right? While that, that yes, we can suffer extremely and yet God loves us. While I said that, when something like this happens, it's so hard, right? It's so hard even for the most faithful Christian, this is something that can totally break you. How do you make sense of this? Why did this happen? I'm sure everybody was asking that question. Was it because they sinned? Did they do something wrong? Were they disobedient? Should they have gone to more countries? Maybe they should have committed to Japan and China? I don't know. Did they need to fast more? Did they need to go to church more? Should they have read the Bible more? What, what could they have done? What, what was wrong? And sometimes we believe that physical miracles, right? Uh, success, getting that job we wanted, that we were praying for, getting that, that, that family that we were praying for, the breakthrough that we were, we were asking for, sometimes we believe as Christians, that is the height of my Christian faith. If I can just achieve that, then yes, I achieved what I should achieve as a Christian. God has answered my greatest prayer, right? Uh, I, I always wanted that healing. I always wanted that job. I always wanted that family, that breakthrough. We all have prayers like that, right? We, we do. We all have prayers like that. 
And sometimes we, we feel just need to achieve that, and that would be the pinnacle of my Christian walk with God. It's a sign that I made it as a Christian. I cracked the code. I figured out how to do this Christian thing. I can tell everybody that I made it. But if that's true, how do you make sense of this? If that's true, that, that that is the pinnacle of what it means to be a Christian, achieving that, right? That answer. What do you make of this? Are they failures? Did they fail in their walk with God? I mean, according to that standard, you would have to say they failed. That family failed. They did not achieve. The pastor of this family is someone that some of you may know. Uh, his name is John Piper, very well-known pastor. Uh, yeah, if, if anyone is going to pray a prayer for this kind of tragedy, it's him. Uh, and I was reading his, his prayer at the funeral. Uh, and I just want to read uh, some of what he prayed for, uh, just so we can kind of understand how to process this. If we can have the slide, it says, He prayed, O Lord God of might and mercy and mystery, you have driven the arrows of your quiver into the breast of your people, your beloved. You have filled our throat with bitterness and gall. You have made our teeth grind on gravel and laid us down with wounds in the ashes of dreams. You have taken away our sleep and replaced our gladness with groaning. You have covered us with the shadows of those we love and we have reached out in vain to touch their bodies. Happiness has left through the window where the rain pours in. Peace has put her hand on the latch, and endurance wavers at the threshold of our soul. A voice is heard like Rachel's, lamentation and bitter weeping. Where is the comfort for her children? Because they are no more. You have spared us, us, who have lived out our days through no merit of our own, who would happily have finished our course and taken their place, but you have not spared children or the valiant young lovers and your most loyal servants. O oh Lord, our eyes are on you. We do not look to another for hope, to you alone. To you we cry. Remember our affliction, remember the bitter wormwood and the gall. You have not made us drink this cup in vain. You are good to those who wait for you, to the soul who seeks you. You are good today. You were good last Sunday. We are waiting, we are looking for the salvation of the Lord. We are not running from the yoke of this dark province or throwing off the burden of your good sovereignty, but we are waiting and looking for the yoke to be made easy and the burden light. You do not hide yourself forever. Though you cause grief, you will have compassion according to the abundance of your steadfast love. For you do not afflict from your heart or grieve the children of men. We know your heart, O God, for there is nothing in the world more bright, more blazing, more terrible, more beautiful, more bloody, more hopeful than the revelation of your heart in the death and triumph of your Son, Jesus. We praise you that they did not snatch a few vain years of life on this earth in exchange for allegiance to their king, but set their faces like flint toward Japan and the finishing of their course in the ministry they had received from the Lord Jesus. And we praise you that they did finish it. Like your Apostle Paul, who wrote, wrote from Rome, I have finished my course, though he never got to Spain. We stand on this mighty rock of Christ, and his shed blood for our sins, and for the sins of the Paul's family, and on his victorious triumph over death. And standing on this rock, we pray. And this is the passage we read today. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, 
yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the great and glorious rock where we stand, or lie prostrate, and on which we give thanks for the lives of Jameson and Catherine and Ezra and Violet and Calvin, who did not count their lives to be more valuable than a needs. Now, did they fail? They did not fail. They finished well. They finished the race well. They did not get to Japan. They did not get their prayers answered. I'm sure this was not what they expected in their, in their worst nightmares. But they finished well. God is pleased with them. They are not Christian failures. Now, it is the face of loss like this that we understand what worship is. Can you truly say, for those of you who are here who are Christians, can you truly say, yes, for that family, they sacrificed nothing. It was not a waste. It was all worth it. Even though they didn't get to Japan, even though the, most of their life was spent preparing for this trip to Japan, even though they didn't get to evangelize to even one person in Japan, their life was not a waste. It was all worth it because Jesus is truly that worth it. As long as they were just pursuing Jesus, even if all of their plans, all of their, their dreams failed, it was all worth it and they succeeded. Can you really say that as a Christian? Can you look at that sudden death of these young people and those children and say, that was not a waste. Jesus truly is the treasure of all treasures. And can you say, yes, Jesus loved them. Jesus is good. Isn't that hard to say? It's easy to say when all your prayers are being answered as you would like them to. It's easy to say when there are no problems in your life. It's easy to say when everything is going well. But I would almost argue that that isn't truly worship because you are not having to be challenged. Your idols are not being challenged in that moment. But in a moment like this, right, it makes it very clear what your greatest treasure is. If Jesus is your greatest treasure, then it was not a sacrifice. It was all worth it. How worthy is Jesus to you? If you are suffering right now, if you are really struggling right now, I know some of you are, this is where worship will really shine. This is where the world will really be able to see what is this person's greatest treasure. That's the time to shine. That's the time to show the world, Jesus is my greatest treasure. And they will see it. They will see the evidence of it. I want to end with verse 6. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. Now, I want to show you something. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, now, what do we have here? We have a very simple graph here, uh, columns here, showing us what Jesus is. He was a man of perfect obedience. He lived a perfect life, followed every command of God. He had no sin. He deserved the pleasures of God. He is part of God's family. He is God's son. He has eternal life. He has intimacy with the Father. He has the blessings of God. And for us, as human beings, what are we? We live a life of disobedience. We're sinful. 
We deserve the wrath of God, not the pleasures of God. We are orphans, spiritual orphans. We are removed from God's family. And we are actually more than just orphans. We are enemies of God. We are actively rebel against Him and fight against Him and take what is His. We deserve death, eternal death. We deserve separation from the Father. And we deserve the curses of God. Now we can go to the next part. This is the great exchange. Right? This is the gospel. Amen. Jesus received what we deserve. And we received what Jesus deserved. This is it. Uh, this is why Jesus died on the cross. It was not merely for you to be healed, for you to get that job. Those are important to God. Again, don't get me wrong here. Those are very important to God. Please keep praying for your health. Please keep praying for your job. Please keep praying for all these things in your life. Don't stop praying for those things. But that is not why Jesus died on the cross. That is not the end game. That is the end game. That is the fullness of the gospel. That was his purpose. That is why he suffered. Jesus did all of this so that we would have unbroken fellowship with our Father in heaven, who is our true love, our greatest treasure, the only one who can satisfy us completely. Now, as we close today, I want us to think again about this Jesus. Do you see him a little bit more clearly today? Do you, do you see some things about him that maybe you didn't see before? Do you understand the heart of God a little bit better? I hope you do, because that is what we're here for. We're here to see more of who God is, to be changed by his beauty, to be changed by the power of the gospel. And I pray that you continue to grow in your understanding of who God is, what he took away from you, and what he gave you in return. Let's pray together.